Hi, my name is Rachel Stevens, and this is my husband. I'm Nigel. <laughs> and we're going to tell you a little bit more about our organisation, which is the Cherry Tree Project, and a little bit more about where it came from, um, what it does, and what we hope to achieve in the future. So, <laughs> who was the Cherry Tree Project? That's us. It is us. We had a vision that we wanted to work in our community, that we wanted to make a difference, that we wanted to provide opportunities. Um, we didn't necessarily know how we were going to do it. And it was just the two of us with a vision wanting to create something. And it was the relationships that we built along the way that has now turned the Cherry Tree Project into something. And the first the first stages of that project literally were the two of us walking out onto the streets, wearing our t-shirts, and the idea was that we would be speaking to young people. It wasn't, week one, do you remember? The rule, <laughs> just say hello to people. We were just going to say, well, even that, that didn't really go. No. How did those first few weeks go, Nigel? Quietly. <laughs> it did go quietly. I think seeing some people come out and give us nervous looks because we were strangers walking around saying hello to kids, so we stopped saying hello to kids and decided that as youth workers, we couldn't speak to youth anymore. So we, well, so we decided to speak to adults and talk to adults. And then we had a, a moment, which was a great, it was a victory. It was a real first victory when one of the kids that we'd been saying hello to, who is, was then, what, 11? Yeah. Yeah. Um, went and told his mum. And said, Mum, there's these two people walk around every Wednesday <laughs> afternoon and they say hello to me and they know my name and I don't know who they are. And this lady came out onto her drive as we were walking past and went, that's Rachel and I didn't know them. And it was really interesting because that was the one, that was one victory because from then on, Zach almost, um, not qualified, that's what's the word, he, in the estate to his friends were was saying, they're all right, they are. They're, yeah, they're, um, they're all right. And people started to talk to us. And his mum spoke to her family, who also live on the estate, and people started to talk to us. I remember the week after that happened, we went down to the basketball court where we walked past every week and were ignored by the kids. And someone threw us a ball. And that was it. The, the game had changed. Suddenly, we suddenly we were in. They spoke to us for five minutes and you could see that they'd had enough and we went on our merry way. But suddenly, we had young people chatting to us who actually wanted to know what we were doing. And our relationship with this one boy made a massive, massive difference. So, what we started to do was ask young people what they wanted. What do you want in your community? What can we do to support you? Um, and Bear initially, in mind the time of year as well. This was March, yeah. April time. So it was still quite cold. Nights were quite dark, quite early. Um, so we started talking to them about what they wanted. Yeah. And what they were asking for. I mean, they were asking for the normal things. They were asking for somewhere to go, somewhere to hang out, somewhere warm. But we knew our limitations and we encouraged them to push for more so we could try and find ways that we actually could step in and do something. And then they started to ask for sport and for games, which brings us on to our next relationship, which we made with Life Leisure. Yeah. They introduced us to Sasha. And if you've ever come across her, you'll you'll know Sasha. She's um, a real joyous, warm, lovely, lovely person. And she met us and really invested in what we were doing and after our first meeting with Sasha we left with sports coaches that were going to come to the field over the, so the summer holidays three times a week and we left with enough money to feed these kids to hang out with them and do sports with them and even to hire a huge inflatable bouncy cattle and we had the best summer of our lives. Well it was great and, it, and it, but you know, to go back as well, when we were planning this, this wasn't what we wanted. This is what the kids had said that they wanted. So we weren't coming in saying, kids, you want this, don't you? You know, we were like, right, what do you want? Okay, can we make that happen? And with Sasha's help and a lot of hard work by Rachel, we, you know, we, we managed to put together a programme that runs through the whole summer. So two, three days a week um, that... The kids could come and they could eat 
and then they could do some exercise or some games and we had sports coaches. But then right at the end, we had a big celebration on the estate <laughs> where it, it, it was like a summer fete. Um, and we had over 300 people turn up. It was the best day. And, and, and people had heard of the Cherry Tree Project, but didn't really know what it was. And I think that after that event, people knew Rachel, people knew me through Rachel, and people from that point, so the end of summer 2019, people knew who the Cherry Tree Project was. They did. We'd started to make a name for ourselves, which left us with an opportunity. Now, I have to say that that summer, as much as we really enjoyed it, there was something missing, which was... All of those teenagers that we went round the streets and spoke to who asked us to create this project for them. They didn't, turn up. <laughs> they didn't come. <laughs> so they, they might turn up briefly, have a game of football, not with us. No. Um, and sometimes we managed to force feed them a sandwich. But apart from that, they didn't join us. No. So towards the end of the summer, we started to ask them to come and give us a hand instead. We had one little boy who. Um, Refused to refused play. Refused to attend, yeah. but came and put up our shelters for us and took them back down every single session. So we asked them and they said, well, no, this is brilliant. We love what you've done, but we're not going to go to something that a five-year-old's going to. And, and I think we learned something there. Whereas we knew that we should be asking the, the, the kids, the youth, what they wanted. Were we really asking them? And at this point, they were really telling us that it's important that it's led by them. Yes. Which I think beforehand, we knew, or we thought we knew. We didn't know what it looked like. But we didn't know what it looked like. Yeah. And we were trying to put what we thought it should look like, a big Nigel and Rachel stamp on it, a big Cherry Tree (laughs) Project stamp on it, rather than listening to the kids and giving them what they asked for. Which is not, it's not hard, but it's not easy because we didn't think they knew. But at the end of the summer, we realised they actually did. Yeah. So, next stages. Kids go back to school. Kids did go back to school. Um, And we knew at this point that what our teenagers wanted was something that was just for them, that wasn't for younger kids. And we didn't want to lose the relationship that we'd built with these younger kids because it had been hard work to build. Yeah. But we also wanted to prioritise our teenagers because they were the ones who created everything at this point. So we had spoke to... We didn't know exactly what they wanted. We realised that we couldn't decide without them. Yeah. (laughs) So we applied to Stockport Council through the Stockport Local Fund and we applied for funding for a project called Project Lab. Now, on paper, it must have looked like the strangest project. We're yeah. really lucky that they put faith in us because what it said was, we want to go out and do some detached work on a Wednesday night, so walk around the streets and hang out with our younger yeah. kids. And then every week, we booked a scout hut from four o'clock, which we wanted the funding to pay for, and we're going to get food for a group of people. We're going to eat a meal, and then we've got the hut for another couple of hours, but we don't know what we're going to do with it. Okay. Because it's their, it's Project Lab, so they create their own projects. And they agreed to funding. So starting at the end of the October, we literally put on the internet, we're starting Project Lab, we've got a hut, we're going to feed you, come along. And I think first week, was it about eight came, I think? And all came for different reasons. Yeah, mainly because the mums picked them up and put them, put them there. Yeah, but there was also, I don't remember, because because it was called Project Lab, some people thought it was a science club. Um, did they? Uh, we ended up with this really interesting mismatch <laughs> of people that you'd think would never work, and it wasn't. It was the perfect it kids. Was, yeah. And the numbers went up. I mean, it jumped from, from 8 to 13 very, very quickly, and I think it stuck there for a couple of weeks, and then... Everyone kind of brought a friend and it was up to almost 20. And at the highest, we were receiving 26, 27 kids were turning up. We were supported by local businesses. So again, by Life Leisure, they gave us a coach every week and helped out with the funding. Um, Our local Italian in Romilly, they gave us a massive discount on food. And we provided this 
feast one night for the kids. Yeah, but the local shops as well, because we cook for them. So if we didn't do the big feast, which was special. It's an amazing uh, night. <laughs> it, you know, we, we'd cook for them or we'd cook with them. And the whole, I know we'll come back in a little while, but what we saw was initially me cooking, me telling people to wash up. As the weeks went on, people were cooking with me and then they were clearing up and volunteering and being part of it and working with the group. Now, the group developed because of what the kids said they wanted to do. Yeah, I think what's interesting is that we started off as two volunteers wanting to work with a group of young people and we ended up with a group of volunteers all different ages. Yeah. When we asked them what they wanted, we we gave them, we said to them, look at what you can do for yourself. Look at what you can do for your families. Look at what you can do for your community and look at what you could do for wider society. And wanted them to kind of put ideas together. And the idea was that we kind of split it between the three. But that's not what they wanted. Every single time we asked them, what do you want to do? It was always about their community. Somebody else. Or it was about yeah, yeah. a particular charity. And they have got, these teenagers, every one of them, have got the hugest, purest hearts of just wanting to do something for someone else. I think the best example was probably Christmas. We went to them and said, we've, we've got some funding, let's have a Christmas party. Who do you want to do it for? And they decided that rather than throwing a party for themselves, they wanted to throw a party for their younger siblings and all of the younger siblings who live in the community. And their advertising for that generated so much support. It didn't cost us a penny. I mean, Asda in Marple, so yeah. Simon was just an absolute hero. We saw the kids plea on Facebook um, and it was literally a picture of, of two young girls holding up a sign and he saw it. And not only did he come along and help us by providing food, but he also got some presents for the girls. And then a local charity shop in Marple as well, they stepped in and put a plea out and managed to get selection boxes for all of the kids mm. that came. And Father Christmas came, the real one, and he came and he met all the kids and he gave them all selection boxes and presents. And this party surpassed anything we yeah. could have done. Like the imagination yeah. behind it was so much bigger than what an adult would have put together. These kids are geniuses and they're brilliant at what they do. And Christmas was brilliant and it was a big crescendo to the end of the year for us um, and for the kids and for the community. But we needed to prove that we could s sustain... <laughs> it's easy for you to say, that we could sustain this. So we said to the kids, how are we going to do that? So we talked about various things. We, we tried to introduce the idea of a tuck shop, but they realised it was actually cheaper in the shop across the road, so they weren't going to use their own tuck shop. Or that we would give it them for free. <laughs> yeah. And we knew that they were right. We probably would. We were given the donation, weren't we, from Stockport Rotary Lamp Lighters? Yes. So we were given... Was it £100? 100 pounds? Quid, yeah. So we were given this donation, um, and every other bit of funding that we had had a label on it, so it was to pay for equipment, it was to pay for rent, whereas this was for anything... So we said to the kids, right, we need to create something sustainable and we've got this money. What can we do? Yeah. And I can't think who came up with the idea in the end, but it was a suggestion that when the suggestion was made, it almost exploded. Everyone wanted a part of it. And that's how they created Cherry Aid, which is an upcycling business. Um, didn't run for very long, unfortunately. We'll, we will be back. Um, but through this, through this business that they set up, they managed to get some free furniture. So they got a table, well, a couple of stools, yeah, but, but some deck chairs. Do, do you remember? So we had a buy-in team who didn't pay for anything because <laughs> they, so, they used the social media. We had a marketing team. We had a um, doing team. What did we call those? The manufacturers. The manufacturing team. And we had a sales team. And each team had a leader. And we all met. And we, we created, and we so we, we got tables and chairs, we got bikes, we got scooters, we got ladders. And we literally, through the four teams, got them, made them better, marketed them. The marketing was like a full circle marketing as well. And then sold them and everything. So we got, we got 40 quid for two deck chairs. 
and the kids were just blown away. And that money is sitting there for them so that we can keep this going. What's interesting is that the donation that we received off the lamplighters, that still sat there. We never got to use it because we used the end of people's paints and furniture that was donated. And I think we ended in profit by, was it 60 or 80 pounds? 80 pounds um, that was made over the space of four weeks. And so at this point, just to set the scene, we've now got a group of kids who... 20 odd kids, 30 sometimes with people dipping in and out. We've got a great relationship with. We meet up every week. We sit down, we eat a meal together. We share our life and talk about what we've been up to, which was just amazing. We've got... We finish eating and then suddenly we've got girls in the corner making TikTok videos, boys over there playing football and then a mismatched group sat making furniture or fixing up furniture and bit by bit people would dip in and sand for a bit and then they go off and someone else is in the kitchen washing the pots. Um, And then unfortunately that's when we got the news that that's when everything hit the fan with coronavirus and suddenly we were actually it was actually a Wednesday evening when when it was it was announced that the schools are closed and I don't know the exact time but I would assume it was around four no, it was o'clock. Six o'clock it was like, yeah no it, it was the announcement came oh, yeah, when... we did the detached at four yeah so we were sat with a group of kids and one of their brothers rang to say schools are closed and we knew that the second schools closed that we were going to have to close yeah it was really interesting on their take on schools closing. Oh, gutted. I remember one of the girls saying, it's not been long, but you guys are family. And it is. It's really sad. So what did we do then? Well, <laughs> then it was Corona time. Corona time. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we originally, the first thing that we did was we just put out on social media that if people needed shopping or if people needed prescriptions or... If anyone needed help, just to let us know and we would we would try to be there for them. We wanted to continue to meet with our young people and we also wanted to know that they weren't out on the street. So we previously done detached work every Wednesday night, so we continued it. Yeah. But instead of hanging out with people, we had um, put a rainbow in your window competitions. And so we had different competitions where our kids had to be at home in order to enter. Um, and us walking the streets would be the way of judging the winner. Yeah. And they went really well, didn't we? We created goodie bags and gifts for people and but handed them out. again, the relationship, I think the relationship there was with the parents of younger kids who will be the kids that will attend Charity Project Youth Lab, Project Lab, in the future. Yeah. So I think that that's helped us build relationship Again, with an, with another group. So with those parents, but also the younger kids that are coming through. And that brings us to the fit and fed. And it's funny because we keep having a conversation about whose idea it was. I, nobody knows. We, no, we don't no. know. I wonder whether it was no one and just magically appeared. But I think, I think it was a joke. I think someone made a joke about how funny it would be if we did some online cooking show. Um and a lady who lives in our community who works for the council, she really backed it. Yeah, and honestly, yeah. she just didn't let it go. So when Stockport Local Fund announced that they were doing some emergency funding, I'm not even sure that I told you I applied for it. I applied for the money. Um, I applied for enough money to feed um, 50 families for two weeks. I applied for £500 thinking it'd be £5 a bag for ingredients. I filled out the application definitely after midnight. I was on my mobile phone, laying in bed. Oh, you had the deadline, didn't you? Yeah. Yeah. I I literally just filled it out on my mobile, laying in bed, thinking, well, it's worth a go. And then I got an email back (laughs) the week after to say that it had been agreed. (laughs) So then the decision's made, isn't it? We've just got the money. So we're now preparing ourselves for the fit and fed sessions. So... The idea is, is that every every Friday at two o'clock, we do we present some kind of an online challenge that will help keep people fit. And then every Friday at four o'clock, we would do something online to a cook along, so people were able to cook, and we would provide them with the bags of ingredients. So all they need to do is open the bag, follow the instructions, and cook a meal. 
Um, and the first week, 15 families did exactly that. They, they logged on, they opened the bag, they cooked a meal. They were exactly the families that we expected them to be. People yeah. that we knew, that lived on the estate, teenagers that had come to the club. Um, and then they told their friends. Yeah, and their friends told their friends. And then people in shops <laughs> told other people. I think... Our expectation was that we would be work, we would be doing this for families, um, and that it would be teenagers, maybe cooking for siblings. But that's not been the case. We've got our youngest member is four. Um, he does a brilliant job every week, and we see some great pictures of him chopping carrots. Um, but then we've also got um, adults that are living alone in our local community. Yeah. And a lady messaged us the other week to say that when she cooks with us, she just feels left alone. Uh, for me, it's the it's the feedback. It's the talking to the mums and the dads and they say my kids have never cooked with me before my kids have never cooked before my kids have never, never had carrots my before. kids have never had veg before and now every friday they really look forward to it and they do i mean we've even got you know, we've got a, 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 our younger son is 16 and one of his friends he's doing it and his mum's on the phone going <laughs> he's never cooked before and he's loving it and and it just it it's the small stories are, are better for me than the big story. And the big story is we've gone from 15 to 100 people doing it a week, which is amazing. And it, it's a lot of work. And, and Rachel <laughs> really needs to take credit for the work. But if you can imagine our house the day before the ingredients go out, this week we've got 100 people cooking with us. We need 100 bags on this dining room table each one filled with the exact right amount of ingredients to be collected by a fleet of cars on the Friday morning that go out before we go and deliver on our local estate and then get back in time to do the show. I think the thing for me as well is that I love doing it. Oh, it's our favourite time. We have so much fun. We've got people who log in each week not to cook, just to be part of the comments and to joke about and have fun with us. I mean, we've got people who cook with us each week who log on, watch the video, commenting and having a laugh, and then when they've finished, they go back and cook the meal yeah. because they, it's two separate things for them. Um, so, no, it's been... I mean, people ask us regularly why we do what we do. Yeah. And it's a really difficult one to answer because we very much have fallen into a lot of stuff. I think it's who we were meant to be and we're in the place that we were meant to be in when all this happened. Um, you know, we've both been football coaches when the kids were younger and all those sorts of things. But this has just picked up a momentum. It's given us other opportunities to to talk with other groups, to, to engage with with other businesses, with local businesses, it will make a difference to the kids on the estate. Not because what we've said or done, but because how they've seen that their actions is making a difference yeah. in their own lives and the simple lessons, life lessons that they are picking up from those around us, facilitated through through the group and 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 others. I think that you don't realise how it feels to volunteer in general, especially if you find the right place, especially if you do what's close to your heart. You can't explain that feeling until you experience it. But also, it goes beyond that to the point that you know, you when you see the benefits of somebody else or something that you have done, you, can't, you don't want to take that back. It is something that you want to continue to do. And it is something that becomes worth working hard for. Um, and it brings out a different side of yourself. It's it's easier to use skills that you, you're you unsure of or that you're not confident about when you're not being paid for it. Because I don't know about you, you would walk into any job and wing it, wouldn't you? Yeah, Richard Branson once said, um, if you're given an opportunity, say yes and then work out how you're going to do it. Whereas me, that would scare the daylights out of me. That would really scare me too. I, oh, sorry to cut in. I can't cook. No, I can cook. I'm not a very good cook. I don't think you're a good cook. Uh, I'm all right. I'm not a great... But if you get a chance, watch one of the videos. You know, I really enjoy it. I really enjoy it. Nobody, if somebody told me on the 22nd of March before we locked down, you're going to have a cooking show, 
I don't like, what, what, where does that come from? It, to, to reiterate what Rachel said, the volunteering just because you can volunteer is, is, is one thing. Um, there's lots of volunteer vacancies out there. But if you find something that is right for you, that's right for the community that you're in or the community that you want to serve and you treat it as such, that's when you'll get the reward. That's when you'll feel the success. And success isn't monetary. And that's the thing that I struggled with when we first started this. <laughs> Just is, when we first started. Is success isn't monetary, <laughs> you know. We're not going to get on TV and have our own TV cooking show. That's not the success. The success is in the 70-year-old bloke coming back to cooking. The success is in the four-year-old discovering how to slice a carrot. And in the 16-year-old <laughs> cooking for his mum for the first time and enjoying it and really carrying on, and the family's built. And for me, the success is also the fact that we, we're sitting at... People compliment us as a couple all the time about how we are how we are with each other, because obviously they don't see us very often. And what they don't see is normal life. And normal life is people get stressed and sometimes... and sometimes can struggle. We've now got Friday nights that we love. We yeah. have so much fun... I mean, even in the build-up of packing the bags, it's pleasurable because we know what the end result is going to be. And we have these amazing Friday nights that are just absolutely brilliant where we get to work together as a team. And I think that whether it be husband and wife or whether it be family, whether it be friends, whether it be in a workplace, being part of a team also has this massive benefit because... It's really difficult sometimes to know your own worth. But when you work with people, you can share with each other what how other people are doing and what you think that, you know, how, how you think they're doing a good job and they'll tell you how you're doing a good job. And all of these things really boost your confidence. So We're coming to the end right now as we talk to you of the, the, the corona virus kind of we're starting to we, 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 the social distancing is still there but the lockdown is, is being lifted so where the charity project goes beyond that we don't know and the reason we don't know is because we haven't spoken to the kids about it no yet. we've not asked them yet and where they say it wants to go is where we will help them facilitate to get it not for us for them and for those kids that are coming through so that there's something for their younger brothers, their younger sisters, and eventually their kids going forward. I tell you what, though, there'll be one massive party. It's going to be a big party. <laughs> we are going to have such a celebration when we get to meet with our kids again.